As many of you know, an attack on the Capitol led by a terrorist organization calling themselves the Scarlet Guard sparked riots in Somerton and led to the deaths of many Reds. I'm Greg Rockefeller. I'm Beth Rockefeller. And I'm Mia Rockefeller. And this is Reading with the Rockefellers, a family book club podcast. Today, we are discussing Red Queen by Victoria Abiard. So grab a copy and join us on this literary journey. Kalorn will find me anywhere I try to hide, so I keep moving. I sprint like I can outrun what I've done to Giza, how I've failed Kalorn, how I've destroyed everything. But even I can't outrun the look in my mother's eyes when I brought Giza to the door. I saw the hopeless shadow cross her face, and I ran before my father reeled himself into view. I couldn't face them both. I'm a coward. So I run until I can't think, until every bad memory fades away, until I can only feel the burning in my muscles. I even tell myself the tears on my cheeks are rain. Welcome to Reading with the Rockefellers. This is Red Queen, chapters one and two. I think um, that paragraph really gives us a a kind of view of something that becomes a defining characteristic of Mare as a character, the ability, the ability to take off and run whenever things go wrong. Exactly. As soon as things start going south, she just starts running. That's kind of her specialty. So Mare is running away from the stilts, mm-hmm. away from home. What happens to Mare as she's running away from her problems? So she runs down a road that she knows really well. Because it leads, the road that leads out of the stilts toward the Capitol River. And she, when she finally stops, she's at an inn. Uh, it's, you know, it's kind of run down. It's on the edge of a small red village. Uh, but there are a lot of servants there who have been following the royal court as they went to Somerton. Is she here to pickpocket, or is she just running exactly. away? Or is it, or, see, I know she at this point she starts just picking pockets in this inn. Is that? I don't think that that's necessarily why she ran away. I just think that this is just the only thing that Mary knows how to do. Yeah, this, it wasn't necessarily her initial plan. She just kept running until she had to stop to catch her breath, and then found herself in a perfect place to start pickpocketing people. And she still needs money, obviously, if she's going to get her and Kaloran out of... But she's not going to get that kind of money here out of red service, right? right? Um, so what happens next? I know we uh, we meet it. We meet somebody here. Mayor meets somebody here at the inn, correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, what? Where? How does she meet this new character? So she's picking all these people's pockets, and it's been she's been doing it for hours. Uh, it's past midnight, so it's really early the next morning, and. She's been picking pockets for hours, and she doesn't even think when the next person comes out. Just another servant that she can pickpocket easily because he's already drunk. And he's not looking. He's looking up at the sky. So, so easy. Uh, but he actually catches her, and uh, I'm actually going to read what it says here. His hand closes around my wrist, his grip firm and strangely hot as he pulls me forward out of the shadows. So he catches her? Yeah. Okay. Is she in trouble at this point? I mean, she thinks she is. Okay. Well, what happens What happens next? What happens when she's caught? And she does. She, she knows nothing about this person except for what yeah. just... He is a complete stranger. Okay, so what, what happens when she's caught here? First, he... He's almost confused that... There's a thief there. Like, he didn't think there was going to be a pickpocket there. And, uh, he winds up letting her go and then giving her money. Because clearly she tried to pickpocket him to get money she needed to survive. So he feels she needs money. Yeah. But not just any money. The money that he gives her is something far more valuable than all the money she's been able to make picking pockets for the last few hours. Yeah. Turns out to be the equivalent of one crown. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's not the kind of money that your average red servant would just be 
carrying around. Exactly. So Your average red wouldn't 100% not yeah, have yeah, whole there, crowns on them. There are some odd things about this servant. Mm -hmm. This is where the servants hang out, right? So yeah. you're, 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 you know this, he's, he must be a red servant. Yeah. Your assumption is he's a red servant. What does she notice about him? Isn't there a little bit of a description about him? Um, yeah. She notices that he, his hair, his black hair is too glossy, his skin too pale to be anything but a servant. But his physique is more like a woodcutter's, with broad shoulders and strong legs. So, he looks like a servant based on his appearance, but he's also really strong and broad. And dressed in, like, clean clothes, Much leather shoes. Much nicer clothes than you would see a servant yeah. in. So yeah. there's some odd things about this particular servant. And he asks Mare really interesting questions that a servant, a normal red servant, would not care about. Like, what life in the stilts is like. Yeah. And, um, is this... you know, whether or not she has a job and if she is mm -hmm. close to conscription and yeah. all these kinds of things he's really interested in yes. that your normal red servant wouldn't be. Yeah, right. he asks, like... How old are you? Is there really no way for you to get a job? Is there no way for you to avoid conscription? He seems really interested in that, and a red servant normally wouldn't be. So, so looking at this from from first meeting this character, is this some kind of possibly red, uh, so a servant, maybe of some caliber that she hasn't met? You know, what I mean, maybe like Giza, for instance, has. Her ability that she well, bef yeah. Before her hand was destroyed, she had the ability to make clothing to sew things that the silvers really liked. Mm -hmm. Is it now there are different classes of servants yeah. we haven't met yet? Maybe this there are servants that are so good at things that are really highly sought after by silvers, and there's few reds that can actually give them service wise or create this product for them, and maybe that's where he gets his money. Is, there, is that? Yeah. A, I mean, we don't know. All we know from Mary's point of view was the stills and how she was raised. We don't yeah. know what kind of other reds there may be. You know what I mean? What other kind of red-blooded mm -hmm. people may be out there that are higher up the hierarchy possibly than she is. Yeah, there's some kind of is. servant right. hierarchy almost. Right. Yeah, it's very possible. That's one of the first things that kind of went through my mind. Maybe he has some kind of trait or is able to manufacture or create something that they really love. Maybe he's a fantastic guitarist or a great singer. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, exactly. Something that they cherish. Uh, but because but there, there was so much off about him compared to what yeah. you see from everybody else at that end, even. Yeah. And um, before, when he's kind of, before he starts asking Mara, like, really weird questions, he does introduce himself. Um, his name is Cal. He introduces himself as Cal. And one of the things, just as we've talked about in this book, one of the things I want people to write down from your description, what did she say when he first grabbed her? His grip is firm and strangely hot. Firm and strangely hot. Because as we know, things are never uttered in this book by characters or described by the author. Unless they have to Unless somehow it comes back around. This is one of those things like we've had you, we've, we've been writing down that, mm -hmm. that you want to kind of hold on to but anyway so we've so cal is who we've met and he's a servant but seems like pretty well off for yeah. a servant for a red actually but for a servant specifically mm -hmm. um he walks her home right back yeah. to the stills and that's when they're they're talking about he's asking these questions and she pretty much just kind of breaks down and tells him almost everything except yeah, she doesn't mention Farley, Farley the or the Scarlet, Scarlet Guard, Guard or even Kalorn. Right, because she's a she doesn't want to get into trouble yeah. from anyone knowing anything to do with the Scarlet Guard at this point. Yeah, just so, everything that happened with Giza. What does she unload on this poor poor guy she's never met? Um, she says that Giza slipped her into uh, Summerton to help steal money, but she says it's what they needed to survive. Doesn't go into the conscription. Doesn't go into Ed Kalorn, anything that's happened with him. Uh, she basically just breaks down and unloads on this complete stranger. She even remarks on how comforting she finds him. Yeah. And how odd that is to her. Because she's not used to feeling like, like that around people. She's uncomfortable with how comforting he is. Correct. Because that's just how she's wired. Exactly. 
She's not used to being comfortable. Comfort is not something she's used to. Okay. Once we get back to, once she gets back to the stilts, what happens at this point? Does Cal come with her to her home? No, he leaves her at the edge of the stilts because it almost seems like the mud and shadows and everything make him nervous, like make him uncomfortable. No, like, you don't know why, but it almost seems to make him uncomfortable. She Okay, and now he's given her money. Yeah. I mean, what you would consider a decent <clears throat> amount of money for a servant, correct? I mean, this yeah. isn't just... Yeah, basically two crowns. Yeah, he gives her another uh, crown. Does he give her anything else other than the, the monies? No. Okay. So, Cal leaves her here. Yeah. And she goes home, finally. Mm-hmm. We all know what's happened with Giza. This is the first time she's been back. What does she come back to when she first comes back to the house? Her father's outside, correct? Yeah. Which is not a normal occurrence, correct? Yeah, it's, it's like really early in the morning so it's the middle of the night and her dad is on the ground which he hasn't been in so long because he's in a wheelchair so he hasn't been out of the house in years and does she talk to him when she yeah they have they kind of have like a conversation about um why they about why she ran why she hasn't come back since she brought Giza home. But and he's... What's he doing? Yeah, he's outside because the power went out. And they assume that they just, you know, ran out of electricity. So they use some of the electricity ration papers that Mare got from First Friday. And when that doesn't work, they assume it must just be broken. And then... Mare sets her hand on the box and she feels something uh, that she thinks is like, you know, just an exposed wire or something that shocks her. And after that, the power suddenly comes back on. The electricity comes back on their house. There was an interesting quote that I liked in this section when she's talking with her dad, too. She says, Red ants burning in the light of a silver sun, destroyed by the greatness of others, losing the battle for our right to exist because we are not special. We did not evolve like them, with powers and strengths beyond our limited imaginations. So it's, it, even in her inner monologue, she sees herself as inferior to silvers. Exactly. Her internal self-esteem doesn't even rise above what everybody tells her constantly. Yeah, she has incredibly low self-esteem. Well, I think most Reds have, that's what they've heard their whole lives. They've raised, they've been raised from the cradle to know for a fact that silvers are above you and there's nothing you can do about it because that's just the way it is Yeah. at this point. Um, now, with the fuse box, so mm -hmm. the, the paper rations aren't working, which they should theoretically work. Unless there's something wrong with the fuse box. Mm -hmm. She touches the fuse box, gets shocked, and everything comes back on. Was it just a breaker down, or is there something more we're missing here? Yeah, was it just like a coincidence, or did it actually have something to do with her touching Cause it? Because it, it goes in line with all of the references to lightning that we've heard mm -hmm. in regards to the way Mare says she gets in, when she gets an idea she yeah. even uses. And this is another one of those things you might want to write down at home, because... Yeah, again, just keep in mind. Again, right. The author doesn't put things in here for no reason. There's, They usually circle back. Yeah. Okay, so she, the, the power's back on. Mm -hmm. And what happens at the end of this chapter? There's something she, does she not come to a revelation at the end of this chapter after speaking with her father? Yeah. She goes back inside, and after everything that's happened, she feels like she just needs something comforting. So she pulls out Shade's letter. And looks at, and she, you know, scans through the whole letter, and she looks at where it says, red as the dawn. And she connects it to the words Farley said in her video. So in Shade's letter, at, the, at one point he says, it is red as the dawn here. Mm -hmm. She didn't think much of it, but we, had you, we wanted to point that out yeah. in episode one. Well, it comes back around... We hear Farley say the same phrase, 
in her video taking credit for the bombing at Archeon, now we have Mare realizing, oh my god, it's in Shade's letter as well. Is Shade a member exactly. of the Scarlet Guard? So she kind of makes, she makes that possible connection that he could be part of the Scarlet Guard. There's another little part of that phrase um, where it says, see the sun rise stronger. Right. Yeah. So definitely some symbolism in the language there. Yeah. And Shade is clearly the smartest of the Barrow children. So then we go into chapter six. Mm-hmm. And chapter six starts at dawn, um, basically a few hours later. Yeah. And what happens to start off this chapter? Um, the door to their house bangs open, and they assume it's just a normal security search. And I really want to point out how normal these searches are. Like, they get, like, two security searches a year. Where people just, literally, they just come and just kick your door open and yeah. search whatever they want without any kind of warrant or provocation. Exactly. And this is just a normal for Red. Yeah. They just accept that this happens. Yeah, That's they have, like, two of these a year. Okay, so they have this search, so they've mm -hmm. come through for what they think is a search. What happens? What are they looking for? Uh, yeah, this one's a little different. Yeah. Uh, Mare notices that there's a red servant there with the security officers, and she realizes before the rest of her family that this is not a usual search. Because where's the red servant from? She's a royal servant. Yeah, she's so got she's the... So she's been following the royal court. Flaming crown emblem on her uniform. Yeah. And what happens? What is the? What do they say to Mare? Uh, they say that she has been summoned to Somerton. And what is Mare's first thought? Her immediate thought is, wait, I'm a criminal, and if they figured out I had ties to Farley, I'm considered a terrorist. So they immediately assume that they found out about her connections to the Scarlet Guard and are going to kill her. So she leaves with them with... No way to meet Farley like she's supposed to that day. Exactly. No way to go see Kalorn and let him know, you know, that she's going to Somerton. She just has to leave the house immediately and go with them to Somerton. Mm -hmm. What do we find out about the royal servant? You find out her name. Walsh? Yeah. Correct. And she's not a stranger to Mare's family. Yeah. She actually also grew up in the stilts. She knew... Uh, both of Mare, the two oldest bro brothers, uh, Bree and Tramie, uh, but she, she had actually dated Bree, and he was kind of a heartbreaker. He had a reputation before he left for conscription. Kind of a jerk. And then what does Walsh tell Mare she's been called to Somerton for? She's going to have a job. She's, uh, going to fill a servant's post. Where is she going? Not just any servant's post. Oh, yeah. Royal servant. I mean, why would there be a royal servant to summon her if she wasn't also going to be a royal servant? True. But at this point, they kick down their door. She, they, at first, they think it's the normal, what they allow, normal, just government coming through your house and doing whatever they want. But then, Mary realizes it's something different, and she's freaking out thinking... They've nailed me because mm -hmm. I went to see this Farley character who now is taking credit for the bombing. Yeah. She finds out, no, she's actually going to be a royal servant. What's going through her mind at this point? Why would they take some random person from the stilts and make them a royal servant? What's going through her mind at this point? Uh, she thinks that it was Cal who got her the job because he said he had a good job. And so he pulled some strings to get the same for her. That's now... It's pretty impressive for a red servant to be pulling strings to get someone as a royal servant, right? Exactly. Kind of an interesting, interesting thought. So, Walsh has a couple of great lines here, too. Um, she tells Mare that as a royal servant, you have to look without seeing and hear without listening. Mm -hmm. So you basically just have to blend in to the walls and be invisible yeah and kind also be a fly on the wall in a lot of circumstances yeah you know see and hear everything without looking like you're being obvious and you're seeing and hearing everything and, yeah and then she says it's never a good time to be a red but this is very bad so 
that gives you an idea of what the attitude in the capital is like with yeah. the silvers. I think it's that's no one is happy. That's interesting. The part where you said um, to look without seeing, and hear, hear without, without listening. listening. Then you go to what Farley said in her video. Mm -hmm. You don't see us, and so we are everywhere. We don't, you don't see us, and so we are everywhere. This is what this is the way Reds have you been used to living for so long. This, they just blend in, and the silvers just see them. They're almost like insects to the silvers, yeah. and that's kind of you know I, I think what she's letting Mare know is what she needs to know about silvers at this point because she's not been around them like they have. yeah. So she's we've we've got Mare now is going to have this service job. With Walsh, correct? Mm -hmm. Is she going to get any training? Do they train her or do they just like nope. throw her to the wolves? Nope, it's literally just, here's your uniform, now go serve these silvers. Okay, what is going on that she's serving silvers? There's something kind of big happening right now, correct? Yeah, it's a very busy day. Even for Summerton. Even for Summerton. And uh, they're having something called Queen's Trial. What is What exactly do we know about Queen's Trial? Because I know... Mayor learns a little bit from Walsh, correct, and the other mm -hmm. servants and kind of the scuttlebutt. What exactly do we know about Queen's Trial? Queen's Trial is where the daughters of all the high houses, the super powerful, um, the great silver families, send uh, they all their daughters compete for the chance to be queen. There hasn't been one in 20 years since the current queen, Alara, was selected. So a, a huge deal. So mm -hmm. now we have Mayor being thrown out there to serve these royal yeah families um so we and we kind of get a little bit of do we get any overview of the royal families here who they are or anything right now or does mayor still not even know anything and she's just out there serving these people uh she starts out just out there uh serving people and all of the uh high houses come in and they all, most of them seem to just be, like, partying. They don't really have much hope to put forth the next queen. They're just on a vacation for some of them. Then there are some families who really care about who wins Queen's Trial. But there's, the servants themselves are already openly talking about, I mean, isn't everyone, that when she's moving in and out, she hears, even the Silvers yeah. talking about, who they already know is going to win. Everyone seems to believe they already know who's going to be the next queen. Yeah. Who's that? Um, a lot of people just say um, the Samos girl, but her first name is Evangeline. Okay, and that's the one that everyone seems to think. So, as much as this Queen's Trial is an actual competition, it seems like everyone already knows mm -hmm. who the winner, air quotes again, is going to be because, yeah. as with everything in the Silvers, we're learning... It's all about perception. Yeah. So most people think that at this point, going through the whole thing is just a formality. So we're, we're having this, the queen's trial determine who's going to be the queen. Who's, then do we know who the prince is? Who is, this, who is this queen looking to marry? They uh, do bring we meet out... the royals? Yeah. They, yeah, we so, get to meet all the royals. Yeah. The king comes out first. He is Tiberius the sixth. The current king of Norda. He has a very long, long name. Game of Thrones sounding title. I can say it all if you want me to. Go ahead. Tiberius Kalor the Sixth, King of Norda, Flame of the North. And does Flame of the North have any kind of significance? Why did they choose Flame? Because uh, the king is a burner, which means he can control fire, but he cannot create it out of absolutely nothing there has to at least be a spark but that's his his silver ability yeah. he can control fire mm -hmm. and heat so he's like a nymph just with a different element exactly and then we meet the queen mm-hmm oh what does the king's uniform look like how is he dressed um he's dressed in like a military uniform although mayor thinks he's never actually been to the war front or in any of the trenches. They have like lots of like medals, don't they, yeah. all along their shoulders and pat or on their chest and patches, everything. Badges indicate... and medals everywhere. Right. For things that they've never done. And his colors are black and red and that's what we see. And silver. 
uh, yeah, and that's what we see the the spiral garden where the queen's trial is taking place. We see it dec decorated in black, red, and silver. Mm -hmm. So, so you said that we we we've, we've met the king and the mm -hmm. queen. Alar is with him. So clearly, yeah. it's going to be one of his sons is what we're looking at. She yeah. is. And the queen, what what's her deal? What's she look like? And what is what are her uh, colors on her dress. Does she dress to match the king? She does not. She wears navy blue and white, which are the colors of her house. And we see her make her way to the box, the royal box, where mm -hmm. they're going to watch the queen, queen's trial. Um, but she stops and does something interesting to Mare. Um, she bows only once. Mm -hmm. And it's in front of the box or the table that has um, somebody Mayor has seen before. Yeah. The uh, whisper from First Friday, Samson, is uh, in that family box. So. And Mayor realizes that he's wearing the same colors as the Queen. Mm -hmm. So he is part of the Queen's official family. Yeah. So it would seem that possibly the Queen has the same ability. Ability. Which is a mental ability yeah. and pretty powerful, actually. Mm -hmm. And so that brings us to the princes. Yeah. Who's the first prince that we meet? The first prince uh, that you see is the younger prince, not the heir. Um, his name is Maven, and he is the son of the king and Alara. Do we get any kind of physical description from Maven? Maven is paler and thinner than the older prince, but he has the same uh, black hair. The entire royal family, except for Alara, has black hair. Okay, and then we meet the crown prince, mm -hmm. and what's his deal? What's his name? His name is Tiberius Kalor the Seventh, officially. Kalor, okay. And what are the names of the houses that he comes from? Kalor. And Jacos. His mother is actually the former queen who died not long after he was born. So that's a good name to keep in the back of your mind, too, is House Jacos. Because mm -hmm. we'll get more kind of coming up on what happened to them after the death of the queen. Mm -hmm. uh, before the king married Alara. Yeah. So, um, the, the prince has an official long-sounding title, mm -hmm. like the king. Exactly. And it is? Tiberius VII, heir to the kingdom of Norda and the Burning Crown. Yeah. So he has this whole long name. It's the official name that they have to use. Does, but isn't there something about this particular character, this particular prince that Mare recognizes? Yeah, it starts with just her recognizing some features but then when he fully turns uh there's absolutely no mistaking it and the crown prince is cal so this is the young man that she met in the inn who caught her stealing and gave mm -hmm. her two crowns yep and clearly got her a job here mm -hmm. so he is the prince cal calor yeah Cal's just his nickname, but it's what literally everyone calls him. So. And this is a, this is he another started. chapter where this is where we end the chapter, correct? Yeah. Where it's like that's that the, the, literally the realization of Mayor. Yeah, literally the last sentence of this chapter is the Crown Prince is Cal. So. So. And I'll sign up. Yeah, Mayor has absolutely no time to process this information mm -hmm. because immediately after Cal makes his entrance. The buzzer sounds like it's going to be a first Friday feat, mm -hmm. but we're really getting the start of the Queen's trial. Yep. So we get a nice parade of families and abilities. Want to give mm -hmm. us the rundown of those? There are, it kind of, it does kind of go through some uh, families, all of them wearing different colors and stuff. So the families that we have are, uh, I'll just list them all and then go back through with the abilities that they have. Yeah, because a lot of these house names are going to stick around for a while. Yeah. And, uh, and are a little weird. 
Very weird. Very weird. Uh, so we have House Provost, House Rombos, House Well, House Osanos, and House Samos. Do not get those last two confused because and they can get confused very easily. These are the houses that have competitors in the Queen's Trial, correct? Yeah. We're kind of meeting as they go through. And um, do we know what kind of powers these houses have? Yes. Uh, House Provost are Telkis. House Rombos are Strong Arms. Uh, House Well are Green Wardens or Greenies, and they can control plants and all that stuff. Osanos are Nymphs, which we already talked about. And House Samos are uh, Magnetrons, which means they can control metal. So when we get introduced to the participant from House Samos... Hmm. Uh, Mare kind of is in for a big shock with this particular competitor. What's her deal? Uh, well, first, when she comes up, she almost seems like the weakest out of all of them. And for a while, she just stands there. And she's not dressed in, like, fine dresses or anything like that, like the other girls. Yeah. This, this girl has not come to mess around. Yeah. She's wearing leather studded with iron. And because of her ability to control metal, that becomes a thing. And so first, she uses the metal studs on her outfit, basically as bullets. And she shoots them everywhere, and they hit the walls, the ground, and the shield that's above them. And then what happens in the aftermath of that? We, we see a big accident occur. I wouldn't necessarily call it an accident. Well, no, maybe. maybe not. So, Evangeline starts pulling the uh, entire row of family boxes that Mare is in forward towards the inside of the arena. And that's obviously going to cause some issues. So, she... Uh, she starts pulling it forward and everything starts tipping. And just as Mare is trying to get herself away from there, get herself away from the railing, somebody knocks into her and pitches her over the rail. So she's falling toward this uh, lightning shield that's above the, that's below all of the boxes, but above the actual floor of the arena. Wow, so... Mare's falling to her death. Exactly. Ex give us a little bit of a, an overview, just so we understand what's happening here, of the design of this area where Queen's Trial is happening. They, they kind of go, she, the, the author goes a little bit into that, correct? Yes. Because it's, there's basically looking down, correct, into where these yes. women, girls, they're teenagers, are basically yeah. having combat, but there's a shield over it, is created to electrify anyone and that's to protect people from outside as well as the people inside correct mm -hmm. there's lots of things flying around being yeah. exploded and so this electric shield is supposed stuff. to de basically destroy anything that is to go in or out to prevent mm -hmm. that kind of thing so now you have mayor falling into this electric shield that's going to yeah. just fry her exactly okay so how badly is she fried she as she's falling, all she can think about is, I'm going to die right now. Like, she barely even has time to think about that. But when she hits the shield, um, it's solid. And she expects to immediately be fried. And um, she bangs her head against it and thinks that she's, like, that she, like, hit, you know, hit her head super hard. Uh, and she's seeing, like, stars, but she's actually seeing sparks from the shield. That she's laying on. Yeah. So but it's not burning her up. She's exactly. reacting to it yeah. in, in a way that she doesn't understand what's going on. She has a great descriptive line when she starts feeling the sparks going through her body. She says, it's like I've been living my whole life blind and now I've opened my eyes. And she says she finally feels 
alive. Yeah. So She should be dead, but for the first time, she truly feels alive. Yeah. We've kind of seen these hints of lightning that have crept up um, in other chapters, and mm -hmm. now Mare is literally describing her body as lightning. Yeah. So she crashes through this shield mm -hmm. and basically destroys it. Yeah. She stands back up, and she's met with Evangeline. Yeah, who's and, very angry because yeah, she just very got upstage. Much not happy. And Evangeline does not like getting upstaged. It makes her very, very mad. She sends a bunch of uh, metal shards, you know. She's taken from all of the metal she's been using through this she, entire time. She's just launching it at Mare. Exactly. Um, and Mare throws up her hands trying to, like, you know, save herself from the worst of it. And... Instead of the metal hitting her hands, she feels like a kind of energy almost under her skin. And then it bursts out of her hands. And at first she thinks it's just like a jet of light, but it's actually lightning. So she's like controlling lightning almost. And... She barely misses Evangeline, and it blows like a four-foot hole in the wall. So, it would have done some damage if it had hit anybody. So, what does Evangeline do at this point? Evangeline can't, she's, she can't even think right now. Because she just about got... She almost just got electrocuted. So, what does Mare do at this point in time? Well, what she does best. Run. 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 So does she get away? Um, well, she she runs for a long time, and she thinks, she almost thinks that um, she can get away because she finds a window. But it's unbreakable glass, so she's not getting out of there. And the sentinels are chasing her, and yeah. she's trying to rationalize to herself. What She happened? says, they're just a bunch of bumbling officers who don't know you. They don't know what you can do. And then she has a realization. I, I don't, don't know, know what, what I, I can, can do. do. So she's experiencing this whole other side of herself all in like five minutes yeah. time. And then, so she can't get through this window because it's mm -hmm. diamond glass. Yep. But what happens to keep her from getting much further? Um, she thinks it's a group of sentinels that have found her. But it's actually fire. It's real fire. And um, she, she thinks, well, this is great. Either I'm going to have to stay back here and the sentinels are going to catch me or I'm going to die to this fire. So either way, I'm pretty much dead. And she tries to use her, you know, newfound ability, I guess, to... Uh, electrocute some of these people, but of course it doesn't work. And so she runs into somebody and they keep her from getting away. And just before she passes out, she hears Cal say, I'm sorry. So this is Cal that has her. Yeah. But there's no way that the crown prince has come for her, so she thinks she must be dreaming. Exactly. And that's our cliffhanger for Chapter 7. Mm -hmm. And scene. And scene. So, a lot to kind of... Unpack there. Yeah, to unpack here. So, we met a, some new silvers with some new powers. We've met new characters that we think is just some... A, some red servant that feels sorry for... Mare, who we find out is actually mm -hmm. the crown prince, exactly. who is finding out who his new wife bride is going to be today, and Mare pretty much crashes all of that. Mm -hmm. So, exactly. as strange as it seems, the way Mare's life was going early, she's going to get, go to war, her best friend Kalorn's going to go to war, mm -hmm. her sister's all messed up, and then now... Mare has this power that only Silver's supposed to have, but we may know Mare's a red. Exactly. That's like the big elephant in the room of this 
this chapter. What the heck? Yeah, exactly. What? Why huh? did this lightning shield not kill her? What are these sparky things coming from her fingers? Exactly. Questions we need answers to. <laughs> but we're going to have to wait until chapter 8. Um, I have... I have one uh, question for you guys. Do you think that um, had whoever caught her, who she thinks is Cal based on what she heard, maybe Cal, um, do you think she would have made it out had uh, he not caught her? Do you think she would have made it past all the Sentinels and security and back to the stilts? I don't know. No. Does she, no. <laughs> no. I don't... As much as I like Mary, and she's resourceful to a point, being in Summerton, well away from home, somewhere she has no idea mm-hmm. what, you know what I mean? She doesn't know And I mean, everyone just saw what there. happened. Right. Yeah, Queen this Charles huge palace, broadcast. it's on fire, so she's she doesn't know how to get through the palace exactly. and how to avoid the fire. She doesn't know how Literally to Literally do... everywhere she goes, there's video cameras right. that are taping her. She's used her power once on accident and has no idea, no idea how, to, how to use it. How to use it. So, no, there's no way she gets away. I think Cal finding her may have been saved her from being killed. Yeah, because, like, the... And, uh... I think this may get brought up later, but, uh... Like, even if she had made it out, even if she had made it past all of that security and everything, she wouldn't have, I mean, eventually, the queen would have found her. Like, somebody somebody would have found her, they wouldn't, they would never stop looking until they found her. So it's the, it's best if she just stays there and faces whatever Instead Correct. of trying to run and hiding. And and this this also the revelation of Mare's ability also gives us our first look at one of the things we had people write down. Yeah, the first the, big foreshadowing. The foreshadowing how, how the the writer brings these things forward early and kinda of gives you hints with the way Mare referred to getting an idea like of uh, being struck by a bolt of lightning, mm-hmm. lightning strikes again, and yeah. then the touching the fuse box and it coming and on. And it coming on. Foreshadowing! <laughs> we had the foresh- so much foreshadowing. We had foreshadowing with Cal. We see the fire here. We huh? She found out that his dad was a burner, mm-hmm. which means Cal probably has the, has same, the ability. same ability. And his touch was hot, his when, touch she was first hot met when she him. first met him. So that was another. So that's one of those things we point out as we meet characters and see things throughout the book. Those little things we point out. All have meaning. When you're reading, right, you want to pay attention to because there the author doesn't really the author doesn't put things in here unless there's a reason for it. Yeah. And she does a really good job of once you go back and look again after you've read through it, of really kind of foreshadowing yeah. things that are coming. Things that you didn't really notice the first time you read it, but going back through and rereading it, you start noticing a lot more right. little foreshadowing bits and Easter eggs and stuff like that. And I know there there was a something in the chapter that struck me um, is that when she first touches Cal, his hands are hot. Yeah. Then she avoids touching him mm-hmm. um, for a while, but then eventually she does come back in contact with his hand, and it's cool. Mm-hmm. So we are to believe that Cal was using his power very shortly before he met Mare. Or either that or his skin is just naturally warm and he had to use his ability to cool it. That can be as well. But He had to like rein it in a little bit. Yeah, either way, he was uh, kind of experiencing like some power usage around the time that he met Mare as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, another thing is he, it clearly shows that if he had been, if he had known he was going to come into contact with a Red who didn't know who he was, uh, if it wasn't a split second thing, he would have hidden that. Right. And that's why his hand was cold the next time he touched her. All right, so I think uh, that brings us to the end of Chapter 7. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll wrap it up here because when we get to Chapter 8, um, 
quite a lot is going to go on yeah. in Chapter 8. So any closing words? Uh, I do have one more thing that I want to point out. There was, uh, I believe, one more ability that we didn't talk about that we missed. What was that? Um, an Oblivion. And I know the family that they come from, too. But they don't mention it in the chapter. We just get we get the age of the girl and the power, Do which I? she's 12 and she's an Oblivion, but her family's not identified in the chapter. I thought it was. What does, she, what does an Oblivion do? Uh, they can explode things. They can explode anything they can touch. So as long as they can touch it, they can blow it up. I think while, while you're looking there, one other thing that... Because so much changes for Mare as we get into Chapter 7 really quickly. One of the things that we need to remember is the Scarlet Guard took credit for these bombings, correct? Mm -hmm. And she knows, or is pretty sure, based on the letter and the things that Farley said where they talked about... Uh, use this where they use the that same phrase that's red as the dawn that Shade is either a member of the Scarlet Guard or definitely within Knows the Scarlet Guard. Existence. Now Mare's got other things on her mind, but that's gotta be something that's gotta be a little bit disconcerting for her. Yeah. Um you know, a terrorist organization that yeah. blew up a Capitol building, what's going on here? So these are things that we're gonna have to look into in the future. But now she's also got She's in a situation where she's screwed. She, you're right. She doesn't even know what's going to happen next. She's exactly. just completely messed up with this whole Queen's trial thing. And she passes out to smoke to the prince, who's the one who got her the job here. So did he know? Is that why he invited her? We don't know. There's so much we don't know here. And then we've got Kaloran still hanging out there and mm -hmm. possibly being conscripted. So just everything's an upheaval here. At mm -hmm. this point, at the end of this chapter, so um, again, it feels like every time there's anything resolved in these books, so much more gets so, opened yeah. up and just makes you. I mean, there's so many un unanswered questions that you want to just keep reading. So. Yeah, now Mare isn't going to be conscripted because she had a servant job, and then does she have does a servant she job have now? a servant job? I mean, is she like is she even gonna live? It's so just so much. So. Will we get answers in the next uh, in our next episode? Maybe. Tune in to find out. Exactly. All right, everybody. This has been another episode of Reading with the Rockefellers. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Bye. 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 Bye.